Mortal Kombat. G2 versus J2. Fight! Alright, hey, what's up, how you doing? So today we're talking about G2 versus J2. This is a common topic in general surgery because at the end of the day, general surgeons are really thought of as the nutritionist of medicine. So we always are having to do TPN, and part of it is because of the gut. We always try to feed the gut. If you can't feed the gut, you have to try and get the gut fixed so you can feed it. So G2 versus J2 belongs to general surgery. Now, there are subtle differences between the two, even though they're both nutritional tubes. It's usually why not this one versus this one. Why, <laughs> excuse me, why this one versus this one. So in order to figure out which one versus which one, we at least need to talk about what one is. So from an anatomy standpoint, esophagus, you eat, esophagus goes into your stomach, hangs out anywhere from 30 minutes to four hours. How fast the food comes out of your stomach is governed by the pylorus. Once you get past the pylorus, the pancreas kind of sits in here, tucked in the duodenum, goes through there, mixes with um, lipase, amylase, whatever, uh, CCK, what, whatever the um, exocrine function of the pancreas is, gets into the jejunum, and then it starts to go down to your colon. Now, that has a couple differences. One, the stomach is big, the jejunum is small. The stomach food in there, even if you eat a big meal, your pylorus decides how much should go out at each time. So there's a time release versus the jejunum, there is no time release. The G-tube can stimulate your pancreas versus the J-tube, if you put it down far enough, it does not stimulate your pancreas. So one little small difference is chronic pancreatitis patients typically have J-tubes and not G-tubes for this reason. So it's really the structural difference between the stomach and the jejunum and the placement of the stomach versus the jejunum as to why we use one versus the other. Now, gastrostomy tubes. Use administer medications, nutrition, release gases from the stomach if you have gastroparesis and they can drain the stomach if you have a prolonged ileus, if you have cancer, carcinomatosis, and your stomach doesn't work, it's just backing up. We can put a G-tube in you to drain your stomach so you don't have to go home with a tube in your nose. It is inserted into the stomach. Now that's an important difference because gastrostomy, gastric stomach. That's why it's called a G-tube, PEG-tube, endoscopic G-tube, surgically paced G-tube. The G stands for stomach. It is the most commonly used because it is the most versatile way to feed someone. It can be placed endoscopically, which means in the GI suite, radiographically, which means by radiology, surgically, laparoscopic versus open in the operating room. All three, doesn't matter which one you do, the importance is to be able to get the tube in the stomach. An endoscopic placed G-tube G is referred to as a PEG tube. So that percutaneously endoscopic gastrostomy tube placement. So this is pretty good video. You can see us placing the scope down into the stomach. Once we transluminate and find an area on the stomach that we can see on the skin, we introduce a needle into the abdomen and then into the stomach. We use a snare to grab a wire that we paste through the needle and then pull it all the way back out of the mouth. Once you do that, at the mouth you connect the peg tube. You then pull the peg tube all the way down into the stomach. Once you've done that, you place a scope back in to confirm placement and then you pull the wire off, put a connector on to hold it in place. Versus G tube just means gastrostomy tube because it was placed in radiology or surgically or whatever. Now, patients that aspirate or have something uh, wrong with their esophagus or difficulty swallowing dysphagia typically have to have a G tube placed. 
Now, aspiration is a little complex. We'll probably get into that more on J tube than G tube. But realistically, if you can't swallow because you have a stroke, you aspirate, it gets in your esophagus, it goes back into your lungs, then we got to think about feeding your stomach as opposed to letting you eat. G tube is a good option. Head and neck cancers, esophageal cancers, because there's a blockage, food won't go through. Difficult, hurts when you swallow, G tube. Palliative gastric decompression, primarily for patients with cancers, whether it's any type of metastatic cancer in your stomach, it's a good option. It's a, it allows patients to go home. The most common cancer that I put these in for would be ovarian cancer because ovarian cancers have been known to coat the entire stomach, which makes it hard for patients to eat. And then you have to do a decompressive G tube. Typically, if you're doing a decompressive gastrostomy tube, it is usually something that we do sometimes in the last six months, usually within the last six weeks of life. These tube feedings are different from J tube feedings because you can do bolus tube feedings. Bolus tube feedings traditionally just means like it sounds, it's like eating a meal. You put a can in at eight in the morning, you put two cans in at lunch, you put a can in at uh, four o'clock and you can put a can in at eight o'clock before you go to bed. So you can get all of those five cans in in one day. You can do it by gravity, which means you can act, you don't have to have a fancy pump. You can just hook it up, pour it in, let it drift in, just like eating a meal, and then your stomach takes care of the rest. You can also put medications through it, which is nice because you can crush the pills up, stick them in, and it works just as well. You can put whole pills in it if you want to. The G-tube is usually big enough to, like something like Synthroid, you wouldn't have to crush it up. Probably better if you do. Crushing up meds to put them in G-tubes is always a little complicated because you don't want an extended release pill. Like if you had extended release uh, Oxycontin and you crush it up and you put it in somebody's G-tube, they might pass out and die and start breathing because they've gotten all of that narcotic at one time. So if you're crushing up tubes, make sure you actually check. Is it still recording? Yeah. yeah. So make sure you check with your doctor to see which ones you can and can't crush up. Now, complications associated with G-tube, you can get infections. Um, this is primarily because these patients are traditionally malnourished, which means they don't have enough protein or nutrition to be able to heal, and that's why you're putting it in in the first place, but they're prone to infections. They're also prone to leakage because the body can't heal completely around the G-tube. Now. They also bleed because this tube can move side to side. Once you pull it out, if that hole doesn't heal, you can get a fistula. You can get ulcerations where the tube is moving if it's not taped down to the sidewall. Ileuses happen initially, but usually resolve. Pneumoperitoneum, that is when you have air in your abdomen. Air in the abdomen from a G-tube usually occurs because the bolster which holds it snug to the skin is not tight. So what happens is it loosens up a little bit, air leaks in here, and then gets into the abdominal cavity or leaks out of the stomach into the abdominal cavity. But you don't necessarily have to have GI content. So you have patients come in and get an x-ray for something else and have free air, have a G-tube. It's not as big of a deal, but you have to make sure that it's not a perforation. Hope that covers G-tubes. Now, cousin, J-tube. J-tube jejunum. Now, a little bit of anatomy stuff right here. G-tube, because you have this reservoir, you can bolus feed it. A J-tube, you can't. A J-tube is smaller than a G-tube. So a J-tube is very hard to get medicines in. If you have a patient that aspirates, and you do a G-tube and they still aspirate, for whatever reason, you have to go to a J-tube because you have the pylorus here. The nice part about patients requiring multiple operations in the hospital. If you have a G-tube because stuff can come back up in the esophagus, you have to stop these tube feedings like food before you do surgery. If you have a J-tube in, you never have to stop tube feeds. Tube feeds can run the entire time. 
because you have not only the pylorus preventing aspiration, you also have the GE junction, that little valve that separates the stomach and the esophagus right there, preventing food coming through as well. So you have two valves to stop food and these are not close. The small intestine basically is supposed to only go one way. So you have to fight peristalsis to get two feedings back up and it's very hard. So aspiration is minimal, almost does not occur. So patients that fail G tube feedings need J tube feedings because it's in the small intestine. But because it's smaller, medications are dependent on the type of medication. So you don't want to give a lot of pills through a J tube because it will clog it, especially if it's a small tube. But as far as nutrition, great. You don't even have to check a residual. With a G tube, what you do is you put can in, you have to check a residual to make sure they're tolerating it. With a J tube, if they have abdominal pain, you stop the tube feedings. If they have diarrhea, you stop the tube feedings. Other than that, just let them run. Small intestine jejunum, first part, first portion of the small, well, second portion of the small intestine, the duodenum is the first. Um, talked about G tubes. Open surgical is probably the most common because you gotta find small bowel, you gotta fit the tube in it, and it's not an easy task. If you can find somebody to do a laparoscopic J tube, that is the way you tell the, the the big boys from the little boys or the big girls from the little girls. A surgeon that can put in a laparoscopic J tube is a well-trained laparoscopic surgeon. Cause it is tricky and you can do it. But like I said, this is this is real skill right here. Most people tell you that it even exists. It does, it's real skill. Needle catheter can, but you gotta blow up a small intestine. It's real tricky, tricky. It's sometimes done in radiology, but again, it's a very hard thing to do and the radiologists don't like to do it. Percutaneous endoscopic jejunostomy tubes sort of exist. The reason I say they sort of exist is because what it really is, is a GJ tube. What they do is they go in and put a peg tube in, but that peg tube has an extra extension that is connected to it and you feed this into, through the duodenum, into the small intestine. So there is, so putting in a percutaneous J genostomy tube um, is very uncommon. They have some small, long, small scopes, but nobody does it because you can hit so much. But they will do a percutaneous GJ tube. So a lot of times if they say they have a J genostomy tube, percutaneous is a GJ extension. Now. Patients with gastroparesis, which means their stomach doesn't work, a J-tube is a good way to feed them, but most of these patients still have a G-tube to drain their stomach. So these patients will have a G-tube and a J-tube, or they'll have a surgical bypass of their stomach and a J-tube. Uh, patients with major GI resections, such as the esophagus, pancreas, duodenum, when you want to give all of these proximal anastomoses, so anytime you do anything to the stomach, the pancreas, or the duodenum, you want that area to be protected and heal. So you do a J tube so you can continually feed them until this heals. Duodenal tumors, strictures, anything in the duodenum that you need time for it to heal, a J tube is a good option. Now, it has fewer complications than a G tube. When you're thinking about aspiration pneumonia, when you're thinking about complexity of tube feedings because you have different options with a G tube and you don't. So I would not say fewer complications, I would say simpler complications and it is fewer but it's really just because of the number of things that can go wrong. A J tube, it either works or it doesn't work. If it doesn't work, you gotta figure out why. G tube, they can erode into the stomach, they can get a bit pulled a little too tight, they can um, leak, get free air, all of that stuff doesn't happen with J-tubes because they're just simple. Put them in a the small intestine and let them work. The, when you do have problems, it's usually granulation tissue around the tube, which is just the way that it heals, or a leak where there's bile. Now, the problem with a G-tube versus J-tube is that if you have a leak from your G-tube, it's not a big deal. It's just stomach content. When you have a leak from a J-tube, it's bile salts in there. It's all that stuff distal um, 
those enzymes that are designed to eat food and they will eat your skin. So those patients come in complaining of a lot of stuff. G2 patients, they'll like it leaks a little bit, such and such, but J2s, when they start having problems, they will call you and they have real bad skin problems and it hurts, but it's still fewer complications. And metabolic imbalances because you can lose bile salts, uh, enzymes, all that stuff. Hope that covers it. Real simple, sum up. G-tube stomach, J-tube small intestine. G-tube bolus tube feedings or continuous tube feedings. J-tubes, continuous tube feedings. G-tubes, you gotta check a residual to see if they're tolerating the tube feeds or not. Everybody has a protocol. Mine is I check 400 cc's every eight hours. If they have a residual greater than 400, hold the tube feedings for eight hours and then check another residual and if it's gone, restart the tube feedings. Everybody has a complex. J2, there's no residual because there's no reservoir. So the only thing you worry about is abdominal distension, pain, or really bad diarrhea. Diarrhea means you're feeding them too distally and you may need to back your J-tube up. Abdominal pain distension means they have an ileus and they're not tolerating the tube feeds. Um, surgically placed traditionally in the GI suite, sometimes radiology or the operating room if GI can't do it. J-tubes primarily surgically in the operating room. If you're slick, you can do it laparoscopically. If you're a regular general surgeon, you probably have to do it open. Uh, complications, different ones, different problems. These few, but real problems. Otherwise, if I had to choose one for myself, I would go with a G2 because I can give medicine through it and have options of two feedings. So this one, I can give you a can in the morning, two cans at lunch, can in the evening, and you're done. J tube, unless you increase the rate of feedings, you're pretty much hooked up to this thing 24 hours a day. Um, or you have to change the calories, do free water, make sure they're drinking water to be able to get out of the house. G tube, people walk around these, go to work, go in the bathroom, dump a can in at lunch, and keep it rolling. Hope this answers your questions between the two. Um, there are a couple videos on Instagram about G2 placements um, on my Instagram. I know there's, I think there's some on um, the YouTube channel or not. I'll have to check. If not, I'll just post one when this comes around. So there will be. And Nucleus Medicine, they do a really good job of showing you what a G2 looks like, how it's placed, endoscopy, stuff like that. So they always get, have good animation. Hope this answers your questions, guys. Let me know if you need anything. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Take care. All right. Okay, so Emma was talking about a patient we saw today where one pops out more than the other. So he's a little different because he has a hernia. Hernias and G-tubes are a pain in the butt. They just don't mix. Cirrhosis and G-tubes, pain in the butt. They just don't mix. Um, again, you have to remember that the nutritional status is the most important thing in these patients. If I can get his nutritional status improved, he wouldn't have the problems that he's having. He has a bad head and neck cancer. So with his, bad, with his bad cancer, he's almost doubling the amount of calories that he needs. But before he got here, he was only doing four cans a day. He probably needs to be doing six or seven cans, six, day, six cans a day. And you can overfeed somebody you want to do that. That's, reef, that's a whole different issue. But he needs to have more calories, but I can't get him to understand in order to have less problems, you need to have more calories but he says, but every time I use it, I have problems. So it's just a vicious cycle. What else? How is like popped out of the stomach? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So the G-tube has a little bolster on the end of it. It's a little solid donut. They also make them that have a balloon that you can blow up pretty big. The ones that don't require a balloon um, that donut on the end, if it's pulled just enough or it erodes and their nutrition is bad, it'll stand between the skin and the stomach. Sometimes you'll have a fistula into the stomach, so they can still get tube feedings in, but some of it will come out. In that case, they get infected. G-tubes don't really get infected. If you have an infected G-tube, that means it's probably in the skin and in the wrong spot and needs to be removed and replaced. Um, 
in him particularly, because he's so thin and not getting enough nutrition, it just erodes through. He also has that hernia, so his tissues, when he moves left or right, the tube moves a lot. So again, it keeps pulling. J-tube don't have that problem because the J-tube feeding, even though we draw it like this, the tube itself doesn't get fed until down here. So the feeds never really leak out. So it never gets stuck underneath the skin. There's a balloon here that holds it in place sometimes, but even if that balloon pops, comes back up here, not a big deal because the tube feeding is still going down here. So you can still just keep feeding those jokers and they'll be fine until it gets to the skin. What else? That's it. All right, questions answered. Thanks, guys. Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with thunder with the rain.